Uh, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining uh, this session. Uh, my name is Joe Lambert. I am the head of uh, the consumer business at Verizon Media. And I'm very fortunate to be here with Max Lefchin. I know he needs no introduction uh, to this community. Uh, Max has built you know, multiple digital technology startups successfully over and over. Uh, you may remember he's the one of the co-founders of PayPal and is now currently the founder and CEO of Affirm. So welcome, Max. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for, for having me. Thank you. Our session today is new rules, shopping in place. Max and I were just talking a little bit before about all of the uh, purchasing we've been doing while sheltering at home. So why don't we start there, Max? You know, what are the, during the pandemic, what are the changes you've been seeing with consumers and the way they shop, the way they think about shopping and, and how are retailers responding? It's really a sort of mixed bag is probably the, the best way of describing it. There's quite a lot of different uh, fates happening concurrently. Literally, if you sample a conversation with a retailer, and obviously in the course of my work, I speak with a lot of retailers all the time. For some, it's the greatest time ever. And for many others, it's the most terrifying time ever. If you happen to be selling uh, tickets to events or travel packages or vacations, ton of great uncertainty, sales are down 90 plus percent, you know, sheer terror, certainly in the first part of, of what, you know, we, we have no idea how many parts this particular event has, but we know that some of the scarier times began in April or March, April timeframe. And during that time, I think lots of travel merchants were, were quite shocked into what was happening to them. Um, on the good side, for travel, the firms, and we finance plenty of uh, vacation packages, travel, et cetera, et cetera. We've seen very steady growth coming into the travel industry. So I think there's a light at the end of the tunnel for, for those folks. On the flip side, if you're selling something that makes your home a better office, a better restaurant, a better gym, you know, whatever it is that you used to do elsewhere and you're now doing in the comfort or discomfort of your own home, making it better is priority one. So standing desks and Pelotons and treadmills and tonals and mirrors and bread makers and kitchen machinery of all kinds, that is booming. And it's not just booming because people are stocking up on things that they would do at home now that they're not going out as much, but also because of the sort of bigger trend of the shift from offline to online. Going out, you know, if, if you were forced to stay at home but were given notice, you probably say, you know what, I always wanted to get into this type of cooking or this type of working out. I'll go and get the item. You can't do that. And so even the part where you would normally shop physically, you're doing online. And so the online shift is just a massive overwhelming trend that uh, we had certainly seen a tremendous amount of demand. How, how bullish are you that the, you know, the trajectory of the trend, you know, and the move from offline to online, um, obviously during the last several months has been, you know, significant. You know, how bullish are you that this is going to be a sustainable trend, you know, post the crisis? No, I think it's going to be really interesting to watch. Anybody who pretends to know what's going to happen next uh, in any of this, to be honest, I think is lying to themselves. But I'll give you a couple of sort of random anecdotes. So my mom is 72 years old. She lives in Chicago. She very much enjoys her community. Purchases she makes are from the people she knows, even if these are sort of durable goods. Uh, she is suddenly surrounded by boxes with smiley on them. And uh, she quite likes it. Like this has gone from, I'm just not sure what I'm gonna do about this to, well, I'm 72 years old, I'm not gonna risk it. So fine, teach me about this internet shopping thing. And uh, I don't think she's going to go back to everything for sure. Although I'm quite confident some of the social interactions that she craves, like the visit to the grocer are absolutely going to come back. And so the, I think we're seeing unbelievable demand for food delivery right now because it literally feels safer. I think some of it will come back and be replaced by going out or buying groceries, you know, hopefully without a mask one day. But things that were, for example, needed to be tried on, needed, will suddenly become not really possible. And so buying one or two, trying both on and shipping the ones that didn't fit, didn't like, it's suddenly a thing. And so I think that is probably going to be profoundly meaningful, especially sort of controversially or counterintuitively for generations of people who didn't grow up with buying everything online and shipping it to themselves. So, you know, my mom is a good example. She may actually quite like it, she just didn't grow up with it. And now she knows she can, and she, she's very happy to do it. 
Yeah. One of the other things that we've been hearing a lot about and, and you've been seeing obviously on your platforms is so many of the consumer segments, you know, particularly younger generations, are looking for alternatives to financial services, payment types, uh, traditional lend uh, you know, alternatives to traditional lending. You know, what are you seeing? I mean, we've, we've seen recently so many job losses, so much fluctuation in income, um, the gig, gig economy, you know, is disrupted. You know, what's a firm doing to be front and centre in this opportunity and, and how are you playing it so that it's a, a safe alternative uh, as people are trying to, you know, manage that fluctuating income? Yeah, I think, you know, it, it's a never a good thing to uh, to celebrate a, a downturn or a pandemic, but I have to say that overall COVID accelerated a lot of the trends that a firm was betting on and, and growing due to sort of some, you know, truths that were true well before the, the current dark times began. A typical credit card agreement is five thousand words long. So consumers do not understand when they'll be out of debt, how much interest they're going to pay, what the real rate is, how to compute the total number of dollars you're going to pay if you're going to use your credit card, and the sort of overall desire for more clarity, for truth, for trust is something that our society worldwide has been craving for. You know, the, the, the emergence of fake news, the don't trust anyone, can't trust anyone, has a projection onto financial services. If you're you know, thinking about using your plastic these days, you're thinking again. So a firm merged almost 10 years ago by basically saying, we will be an honest alternative. We'll tell you exactly what the schedule is. We won't charge you fees. We won't charge you late fees. If you're late, we'll tell you you're late, but we won't profit from the fact that you stumbled or you forgot or you know what else. And so we've built our entire brand and our story on this idea that we will always be on your side. And if you are behaving like a responsible adult and you are doing your part, we will do our part and we'll never profit, we'll, we'll never screw you basically. And as the pandemic hit, all those messages resonated 10 times more, just much, much, much stronger with the same audience that said, what used to be a nice luxury, I didn't know how to use my credit card, I would put it aside, I would use a firm. So, well, I, don't, I definitely don't want to get screwed right now because who knows how long my job will last. I would rather know exactly what my payment schedule is. I'd rather know exactly how much I'll pay, if any, of interest, et cetera. And so stepping into that opportunity has been very strong for us even before the pandemic, but the pandemic really brought out the need for the kind of product that we're building. And um, it's really sort of rewarding to see. One of the things that's really happened, and I, I said it at the outset of the pandemic publicly, we've never charged late fees. It's one of the sort of brand promises of a firm has been, we won't charge you late fees. We will remind you, but we, won't, we will not make it more expensive just because you're late. And I called on the financial industry to uh, do the same thing. And, you know, I, it's good to sort of get on the podium and pound it a little and say, hey, everybody, bad times are upon us. Don't charge everybody late fees. And I was actually a little bit shocked to see that multiple companies have stood up and said, yeah, that, that's right. We won't do that, which, of course, maybe I shouldn't be so shocked at the, uh, the human nature ultimately wanting to do the right thing. But uh, if you told somebody 10 years ago, financial industry, you know, companies like Goldman Sachs building the Apple card saying, yeah, we will opt out of late fees. You know, I, I, I think a firm sort of pioneered that uh, the trail a little bit. So I'm very happy to see that change. That's fantastic. And so what other types of, um, you know, financial services products are you looking at then in the space? I mean, obviously we have these younger generations who are, you know, even since the world financial crisis, 2008, 2009, we've seen these people wanting to opt away from traditional financial institutions um, you know, lending's one piece. Where else are, is um, a firm looking to, you know, serve this community? So one of the things that we launched literally just a couple of weeks ago, something that's been in the making for a long time, is a savings account. And uh, so from the very outset of a firm, I'd always said it's going to be a at least a two-act play. Act, act one will be, trust me, I won't screw you. Let me give you money. Please bring it back. And you know, surprisingly enough, it actually takes a while to convince people that I'm not cheating them. I'm not trying to do something, uh, something tricky. I am really offering money when you need it. And so long as you pay it back on time, there's no, no hidden gotchas, no fine print. And act two would always be, now trust me, give me your hard earned and I will give it back to you with interest. And as simple as that seems, that's a much harder barrier to, to get over because like, well, okay, I have it and now I'm trusting you with it. What, what happens if something happens to you? And so we, we rolled that out just a little while ago with a partner, of course, since we're not a bank. And it's been amazing. It, it's available to our users. So if you use the firm at the point of sale, you can then take advantage of a firm savings product. 
and it's been growing really, really well, further confirming that people are hungry for this sort of super transparent, super honest, no fees, no minimum balances, no, no asterisks, you know, fine print as a business model is, is something that's I think going away under assault by companies like a firm, which is, which is really a thing. Um, I'm never one to pre-announce products, but I think if you literally slice out financial services industry, anywhere you look, someone has figured out how to make money by putting in something in really small font that says, if you don't look over here, you won't know what gets you. And our job is to come in and say, that has to go, like we have to clean it up and, and reform it. And so we're, we're going after all of these products and there are plenty of them, you know, everything from debit cards to investment management, there's always fine print of some kind. I was just going to say one of one of the platforms that I oversee is Yahoo Finance. So I was going to see is Act Three potentially in the uh, investing space. Yeah, that's probably one area where there's already tons of great competitive activity. Obviously, Robin who just announced the stellar financing right in the middle of their uh, of, of, of the pandemic. So they're they're seeing great, and the stock market is obviously fueling a lot of that growth. And so I think that's probably one area where you know our our kind of expertise is probably uh, not most needed. Um, I think more in terms of consumer finance, your regular Joe and Jill that need to buy, need to save, need to pay for things. Those, those are sort of a daily use products for everyone. And we want to make sure we bring our version of honesty and transparency to them. That's great. Um, so on that topic, you know, in the commerce environment, especially during this time, and even in the lead up to the last, uh, this crisis, you know, we've seen so much news and activity in the commerce space, both, you know, the large players, we've seen Google make some significant moves, Facebook, Pinterest, all looking to become much more relevant in commerce. Um, and then now this is against the backdrop of a number of retailers, you know, filing for bankruptcy and really struggling, while some other retailers are making bold moves into, you know, subscription type products. I'm thinking of, you know, the Walmart, the Walmart Plus, you know, what are you seeing in the landscape, you know, from a commerce perspective? Who are the players that you think are making the right moves and, and where do you think we're going next? Just a lot of really interesting things happening there. Um, I do say you called out Walmart and they're a partner of ours, so I'm, I'm a little bit biased, but I think their story has been just one of an unbelievable comeback. I think, you know, five years ago, they've been written off as the last generation's, you know, maybe the one before last generation's store you know, the new generation chooses online. And I think Walmart, walmart.com and Walmart plus, and like all of these sort of various ideas that they've had and executed on just have been universally interesting and, and many have been successful. Um, in addition, by the way, to the fact that they have been just great from the ethical point of view, like it's unrelated to commerce, but the fact that they're mandating mask wearing and getting out of selling weapons, you know, it doesn't matter what your politics are. I think they've taken so many of the right choices from sort of a human decency point of view. I'm, I, I have a lot to, a lot to, 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 to admire there. Um, so I think they've done well. The, relevant to your question, I think Walmart and many other offline brick and mortar stores have recognized even before the pandemic that the square footage of your superstore or, you know, be, be it on Fifth Avenue or, you know, in, in, a, in somewhere deep in the suburbs, can be a fulfillment center at least as much as it is a showroom. In fact, it may well be fulfillment center only. That, those conversations have been happening well before the pandemic and the pandemic just accelerated, which is, well, the store is closed. But the good news is we have a lot more shelf space now from which we can do buy in store, return over mail, or buy over mail, return in store. So all of these new fulfillment models and logistical optimizations, for those who are paying attention, for those who are willing to deploy you know, everything from better software to robots, et cetera, have been kind of an opportunity to experiment and, and expand and invest. I think folks that said, this will go away any minute now, we just need to renegotiate our leases and survive a little longer. It's taking longer than expected. And I think they're paying for it very sadly with bankruptcies and leases that uh, go to zero. And so I think, you know, parenthetically, commercial landlords is probably least talked about most endangered species right now because there's just so many stores that are essentially permanently out of business. Um, I think that's one class of sort of more intelligent, more innovative um, offline brick and mortar operators with a really healthy appetite for shifting to online or partially shifting to online. I think if you look at um, commerce platforms like big Shopify, all these folks that power online retailers, 
I think every one of them has seen this as the greatest opportunity of all time because suddenly everyone who had ever developed a custom piece of software that somehow stitches together their back office, their inventory management system in their sort of decrepit card taking or you know, payment processing system for in-store is willing to say, you know what, scrap all of that. We just need to get a perfect system going online because suddenly that's where 100% of our business is for the foreseeable future. So every one of these, you know, Magentos and Commerce Clouds and sort of anyone you can name, I'm sure every one of these people is seeing exactly what we're seeing, which is lots of brands that you traditionally hear things like, well, you know, in three years when we're done replatforming, replatforming is the bad word of every old school commerce retailer. When replatforming is done, then we can talk about your innovative idea, whatever it may be. Suddenly the replatforming is out the window. The platforms, the merchant platforms are the solution. And so I think that they're experiencing unbelievable demand. And I think retailers are looking to them for, for ideas and, and ways to accelerate their growth and stimulate demand. What, are really smart. What role, what role do you see like, you know, AI and VR playing in this space, you know, in, in terms of disrupting commerce and, and the, the, the industry? No, I think AI is such a blanket term as a, you know, and at, at some point I had a computer science degree, which I still like to, uh, drag out as the last resort, you know, if this entrepreneurship thing doesn't work out, I can go back to writing code and AI is such a broad term. Uh, but I do think that, uh, machine intelligence, machine learning of various kinds is just a massive set of opportunities, but they are very widely distributed and very widely varied. The, the one that sort of gets least airplay because it's been around for so long, but it's yet just such an undernourished thing for every retailer I've ever interacted with is personal innovation. Second sale is the easiest. That's the sort of the, the truest adage from, uh, from retailers. You show up to a store, they know who you are, they know what you like. They'll sell you the next thing that much easier before they had to get to know you in the first place. And yet online I show up and I'm told uh, over and over again, hey, you know what? You're obviously in the market for, uh, you know, a Peloton bike, which I love, but I have one. And so I think that that's someone's, I know it's not Peloton because their retargeting is exceptional, but someone is doing some remnant inventory, et cetera, et cetera. And so AI and ML and whatever you want to call it, just tightening that personalization, making sure that what you see is really, really relevant to the person who's shopping is, uh, is, is, is the biggest opportunity that I can think of on the spot. Um, in addition to that, I think, um, a lot of the back office, and by that I mean supply and logistics management, will ultimately be done by AI. And again, I think it's more about machine learning versus sort of a magical general purpose intelligence, where predicting demand and figuring out how the, the waves of demand are shifting and how to make up for that with supply all the way out to manufacturing is something that traditionally is a domain of humans. And I think humans have proven themselves uh, unable to meet demands during peaks and troughs. And a lot of retailers, by the way, saw what they expected to see in Q4 online in Q2 of this year. I am dying to see what happens at the end of this year as Black Friday, Cyber Monday are completely disrupted by Mother's Day sale and Memorial Day sale in the US and uh, we'll, we'll find out. But uh, if that demand is still there, all that logistical work better be done by some very smart humans or decent enough AI. Yeah, I'm getting the uh, the the virtual hook coming at me very fast, but I've got a couple what, couple of quick questions. First of all, it'd be remiss for me not to ask, given the audience we have here. You know, you've had some very successful tech startups. Uh, what advice do you have for some of the the fintech founders here today? I'll, I'll give an anti advice. I catalog all sorts of advice. And if, if you sort of look around online, there's always some, some blog post or some article somewhere that I decided to write down all the things I learned. And ultimately I think, uh, maybe those are unique, but there's one broad thing that I've learned not to do. Anytime you think you have an especially clever idea that has to do with financial engineering, where you're sort of structuring something very clever or pricing this and doing that, you're not the only one to think of it. And it's probably not a true advantage anyway. So I, I would pause on those ideas and look for things that are ultimately financial services is just like any other service. It's either a great service 
and you found a way to bring it to lots of people. So distribution advantage or product advantage. And if you have neither, you just have a really clever financial advantage. That's not sustainable. It's not worth doing. All right. And when last question, when this pandemic is over uh, and you know things hopefully return to some form of normalcy and travel may be back, where is the first place you want to travel to? London. Love London. I cannot get enough. It's, it's my standard sort of a, it, it's the most cosmopolitan place that is outside of the US where everybody still speaks perfect English. So I, I need to go back to uh, Hatchard's is, is the bookstore that I, I have a, an endless need for spy novels. And I go to Hatchard's and I find some first edition John le Carre and I'm happy, happy as a clam. I've missed it. Fantastic. Well, let's hope, uh, let's hope we can get back there soon. Thanks again, Max. Thanks for joining us today. Everyone, I hope you enjoyed the session. Thank you very much.